Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. I'm Night Phoenix and today we are going to discuss how to play a game of Doorkeeper. Doorkeeper, if you've been paying attention to my channel in uh, recent days, is the updated name of my trading card game which was previously known and referred to as Base Based. So today we're just going to kind of go through the basics, kind of how to play the game. Uh, I don't really have an opponent to play against, so it's just going to be me kind of setting things up. Um, as you might kind of notice right away, I am recording my screen here on untap.in. Now I'm pretty new to untap, so if you notice any sort of kind of clunky mechanics on my part i do apologize hopefully in future videos that should get a lot better but let's get right into it so first of all i i would like for you to check out my previous videos um, on base based um, at the very least please check out the lore video for doorkeeper um, i'm going to kind of be referencing it here and there um, it's important to the kind of fundamental game mechanics. It's not that long of a video. Please check that out and then come back here. All right, second, um, back to kind of untap. So untap is uh, it's a pretty decent site from what I've seen so far. However, the way that this uh, today's video is going to go playing the game on here is a bit different than the physical game uh, for one thing. As far as I can tell, Untap only pretty much allows you to input images for cards and uh, card tokens, but not anything like plastic chips or little cubes or whatever you use um, to help keep track of certain things when you're playing trading card games. So today I kind of have some placeholder images, uh, just kind of bear with it for now. But let's get right into it. So first of all, we're going to insert the deck. Um, as you can see here, I really only have one deck made so far. There's going to be you know, quite a few combinations of decks that you can make. Um, at the moment, I believe I have, uh, I think, 110, 115 different cards. Um, some of those are going to be part of set two, but uh, really since I'm you know, just kind of doing this from home, uh, the sets might be combined or whatever. I won't make a, a big deal about what cards and once and what set. Um, but before we get any further, something to keep in mind for this game in general is that there's going to be a lot to take in at first. There's a lot that you can do, and I don't want to overwhelm you, but I hope that it's still pretty intuitive. Um, I like to think that the core of this game is pretty simple, but that there's it's complicated in the way that you explore this uh, simple core with complex different card effects and combinations. Um, just as a sort of elevator pitch, this game kind of plays like chess, except Instead of pieces, you have groups of cards that represent different units that have their own effects and stats, like Magic, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, that kind of stuff. And uh, you're trying to get to the other side of the board, so to speak, uh, and defeat your enemy's champion, known in this game as their leader, more specifically their passive leader. We'll get into that um, pretty soon. But, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, um, there's also quite a few stats you're going to have to keep track of, but um, if you go to the rule book, which I should have in the description, at the end, that last page is going to have a legion tracker and a leader tracker. That'll make more sense later. Um, that should really help out in keeping track of stats and everything. But for untap, it's a little bit harder because I can't really have that page up. I'll see if I can do anything about that. Maybe if I can send you guys a link to a page you can kind of fill out as the game goes. Um, it's going to be a journey for you and me, but I uh, hope it's a great journey and let's have a good time. So let me load up this deck 
It's known as fossil sores because that's sort of the name of the archetype. All right, let's see. The game is not loading, or the deck isn't loading. Let's try that again. Oh, gosh. Well, that's a little frustrating. Okay, so, sorry about that. All right, we're just going to kind of do a little meter match against myself so that it helps you to visualize things a little bit more. Of course, keep in mind that things are mirrored, so you're going to want to not exactly replicate how it's going to be up here. Just kind of pay attention to my side. So first things first, um, in base space, excuse me, in door keeper, uh, again, you want to get across the board. Um, but once you get to the other side of the board, when you want to enter your opponent's base, uh, where their leader is residing, you can't just enter it right off the bat. They have several sentries, which are sort of putting up a protective field, and you can't enter their base until you destroy all of their sentries. And you have a sentry for each color of fealty. Again, check out that lore video. But for right now, what we're going to do is uh, play this sentry token. Excuse me. This is, um, of course, just a really simplistic kind of sentry card. Um, in the physical version, it will be represented by a circular white little chip. Um, but for here, we're just going to play that and put on a few counters. I'm playing... So the maximum, excuse me, the maximum amount of centuries that you can have is three. And I have about three counters to put on here. Perfect. Okay. So next, what we're going to do is we're going to put out our leaders. First, I'm going to play my active leader right here, set it off to the side. Um, this is going to be another difference between the untap and physical version of my game. Uh, normally, your leaders would kind of go in the middle here, but there's not really room there. And I mean, I know there's room right now, but there won't be once we set up our field. So yeah, this is going to be my active leader. Your active leader is the leader who goes around on the board and is commanding your troops from the field, while your passive leader just put that over here is the leader kind of ruling things from the sides from the sidelines and if you'll notice in the upper left hand corner here in both of the cards there's this number three on this yellow banner so that's going to be your order count orders are very fundamental in the game orders are basically the commands that you give your troops and dictate you know, what you're going to do. Are you going to play a card? Are you going to um, attack another card? Are you going to, you know, do whatever? So you add both of your leader's order counts. Um, they reset each turn. So three and three is six. So I have six total orders to work with each turn. Right now, both of my leaders are at level one. So we're going to indicate that here by just marking down a 1 and a 1. This top is going to be for passive, and this bottom is going to be for active. And our next card, oh, right, sorry. All these cards that are in your hand right now um, aren't really in your hand, per se, for the physical version. Again, this is just how I'm kind of incorporating it into untap because you have to set this up yourself. So this right here is going to be my legendary monster. Um, most of your cards in the game are referred to as units. And your legendary monster, you can kind of think of, like if you're playing Yu-Gi-Oh! as an extra deck card. More specifically, like a fusion monster, because it's going to have fusion materials listed on the right, if we're using Yu-Gi-Oh! terminology. But um, unlike fusion monsters, legendary monsters, you can 
either use their specific sacrifice materials or you can satisfy um, like this this tributes count which is indicated in the upper left corner um, this is a bad example because it just has an x but normally there would be a number there and that would indicate how many units you'd have to sacrifice in, in order to summon your legendary monster that have to have the same fealty fealty again is um a card's like color which is indicated in the upper right hand corner for this particular one their color is red okay and this is actually supposed to be face down and we're going to move that over off to the side because it's not too important right now i can't really use it at the moment so right now i have these cards which if you kind of notice are turned sideways these are your territories so in doorkeeper in order to summon a unit i keep talking about all these units you need to excuse me uh you need to have a certain amount of tokens specifically in this game known as power tokens and power tokens have their own element which is determined by what territory they are produced from so we're going to go ahead and we're going to place these face down onto the field there are quite a few different elements in the game of doorkeeper for right now we'll say that there's just six uh there is light and dark known as lucent and tenebris there's fire and water known as pyro and aqua and then there is wind and earth known as mistral and terra so right now we are putting down the water territory again aqua um, it's just called the cove the name isn't particularly important but right we're just gonna play these face down like so and rotate them accordingly try and kind of center that or center your cards you don't really have to but it just makes things a little easier So just give me a second here to set everything like so. The snapping is a little frustrating because it doesn't exactly snap to where you place it, which is annoying. But um, as I'm explaining this, uh, let's see. So you have to include amongst your territories at least one card or rather a few cards that have the same element as your passive leader my passive leader it has the tenebrous element which is indicated at the top center of the card that a uh, crescent moon and skull symbol which is also here so i am of course fulfilling that requirement and face down pivot set face down pivot set face down um each player gets nine of these well nine plus one that plus one is for the elements of your uh, base where your passive leader is going to kind of chill during the game and you will have these face down just so that your opponent doesn't know what elements that you're working with to kind of you know give you an important edge on them information is valuable in any game that you're playing and this one we're going to play face up and we're going to pivot it like or we're going to tap it like so there we go set that over here normally in the physical game again this would kind of be right about here because that's sort of geographically where it's located your sentries would be placed 
right here in this uh, like row zero, so to speak, but we're just going to keep it off to the side here. Also, there are what are known as movement cost tokens. So like in, uh, say, a normal game of chess, if you go back to that analogy, when you are moving your pieces across the board, like let's say you have a pawn and you know it's just moving one tile at a time, in Doorkeeper, how this works is you have basically a cost of one to enter. So most cards have a, a movement speed of one. So you think it cost one to enter, I have a speed of one, I can therefore enter it, and then I can't move any farther. However, in Doorkeeper, you have movement cost tokens, which you can place on your cards to increase their uh, movement cost by one or by two. In the physical version, they will be green for plus one and red for plus two, but for here, we're just going to sort of add a counter to all of these, like so. And this will indicate whether or not they're going to be plus one to enter, um, plus zero to enter, or plus two to enter. And when you start, you're going to kind of enter from your back row. So you are going to possibly, depending on how you want to play, not have it too difficult to enter for you in the back so that you can conquer your own territories right away. Um, it's very important that you, because one of the uh, things you can spend your orders on is conquering a territory. So, for instance, if I have a card, I'll draw my cards in a second here. They're going to come from these two decks. But let's say I enter this territory and I flip it up. There we go. It's going to be that tenebrous type. Tenebrous, again, is the, uh, the dark type, the dark element. So at the start of my next turn, it's going to produce a token for me. And I'm going to use that token to summon a unit. Let's flip this back face down, like so. All right. So we're going to set these all to one, because that's the default kind of cost. Uh, these we're going to make plus two. You get three green movement cost tokens and three red movement cost tokens. So these we're going to make especially difficult and put them at three. That's the plus two, Oop, not four, sorry. All right, nice. Now, uh, how this game normally works is like you roll a die uh, to figure out who's going to go first. But since I'm the only one here, I will decide who goes first. And I decide that I will go first. All right. So um, I'm going to go first. And I will draw a combination of cards from this is going to be my resource deck. And this is going to be my unit deck. So unit is your armies and your monsters and your siege weapons. We'll get to what those mean in a second. Um, your resource deck is like your spells, sort of. Um, they're referred to as artifacts, and there's also constructs, which you can play on top of one of your conquered territories. So I'm just going to kind of make this simple, and I'm going to draw, um, we're going to say, three from my units. And actually, we're going to draw five. Perfect. All right. So player one draws five cards. Player two will draw seven cards because they will go into their draw step. Uh, in Doorkeeper, you actually don't just draw one card at the start of each turn. You can draw two because um, in this game, movement is very important and you're going to lose a lot of cards as the game goes on really quickly because most cards only have one health so i thought it would be 
kind of not very fun if you were not able to draw lots of cards and because I really want this game to be a strategy of what you're doing on the field not oh I don't have any cards in my hand type of thing so not only can you draw, draw two cards per turn well let's just say um, I don't like uh, two of these cards I can discard one time I can discard those two cards they'll be sent to the discard pile and then I can draw up to two cards from whatever deck they came from. So let's just say I don't want this ice troll. I can send it to, uh, let's see, the discard pile, and I can draw a card. Come on. There we go. Like so. But you can only do that during your discard uh, step. So, I have my cards in my hand. Now what am I going to do? So, at the moment, um, I only really have one sort of card that I can control on the field here. And that's going to be my active leader. These stats on the left, this 1, 2, 2, 1, are his health attack, counter, and speed at level 1. And then every time it levels up, you increase those stats by 1. And that just keeps going. And movement speed, that green one at the bottom there, can only go up to 3. So how do you level up your leader? You level up your leader by paying tokens equal to whatever level you're trying to get to. If it's at level 2, and you want to get to level 3, you have to pay 3 tokens. You can only level up from, you know, like 2 to 3 or 3 to 4. You can't go from 3 to 5. And you can only level up each leader once per turn. So why do you want to level up your leader? Well, besides increasing their stats, once they get to a certain level, they activate their effect. Um, for Khan, on the left, you will see those 4 white dots that means that once it gets to level four its effect activates and its effect reads as follows once per turn when you summon a unit over summon a unit with the same name from your deck if no copies remain shuffle any copies from your void back into your deck so basically what this card does is is uh, it plays an extra copy of a card that you just played for free over summon is like special summon from Yu-Gi-Oh. Um, for this game over summon means you don't have to spend an order to summon it, and you don't have to spend any tokens. And as a rule of thumb, all of your territories are going to produce one token. Let me just see if I can move this on top. Perfect. Are going to produce one token per territory, unless uh, there's a card effect that changes that. And they will produce... Um, whatever element. So if you produce a token on this particular one, it's going to produce a tenebrous element token. All right, and also your base territory has to be the same element as your passive leader, just like how you have to include that element um, somewhere within here. You can play uh, at the moment. This might change. Like I said, we're still kind of early testing. But at the moment, you can play as many different elements as you want. Uh, that kind of That's up to you. But the more elements you play, the higher your fealty is. And for the opponent that has a lower fealty, who would, by extent, then have fewer sentries, they can play an extra legendary monster just one though so like i have a fealty of three so i have three centuries if my opponent had a fealty of two they would have two centuries but they could play two legendary monsters so that's just to help out with uh, kind of diversity of play but all right let's see what sort of cards we got into let's just go into how cards really work so let's see uh this one right here is known as the summoner that name right there in the middle um, going left to right. On the left, we have that two on top of a red circle. Red, if you recall, is for health. So this thing has two health, 
It's not particularly good as far as stats go. Um, right below it is its element. That's the Tenebris element, as I've been mentioning several times now. Um, to the right is that fealty color. That's yellow. Then back to the left, um, right there we have those dots. Those empty rings just mean uh, so you can a card's cost is like a maximum of uh, seven, seven power tokens at the moment. Um, but you'll notice that these are uh, yellow or gold. And what that means is that, so like you have your base cost. There's three dots, so your base cost is three. But your base cost is normally, or like your cost normally, however many tokens or dots there are, and those are normally white. But right here, it's golden. So what that means is that that's its specific cost. That means that three of those have to be of the same element. And let's say you have only fire element tokens. You can spend a token to convert another token to whatever element you need it to be. Or if you, at the start of your turn, have another element uh, territory, then you can just put your power token on top of that territory. Okay, so kind of turn one, you're going to produce one token for every territory under your control. Right now, you don't control any territories, except for your base territory. So right here, we're going to produce one token, and you produce a token equal to your passive leader's level. Again, that's going to be indicated right here. And so I'm going to produce one token for my level one passive leader. So one plus one, if you recall from school, is two. So I have two tokens to work with. Now let's see if any of my cards cost two. Unfortunately, they all cost a little bit more than two power tokens. Uh, so what can I do? Well, if you recall, we can level up our leaders. So I can either level up Khan or I can level up Vlad. Um, I'm thinking that I want to level up Khan because I really like his ability. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to spend those two tokens to go from level one to level two. Indicate that like so. Okay. Um, Vlad, of course, has a pretty good ability, and it will be useful later on, but with Fossil Sores, there's quite a few cards that have a high cost, and so with Khan, it's going to be really helpful to play those cards for free. Um, but let's see. Anything else I want to do? Hmm. Well, another sort of uh, mechanic of the Fossil Sores is that when they are discarded, they don't go to the discard pile, they instead go to the graveyard. Or, excuse me, in other card games, it would be referred to as the graveyard. But in Doorkeeper, it's referred to as the Void. So let's just say that I want to discard my Fossil Sore Helicospine. We discard it. So it's going to go there. But actually, this is like the discard pile. And then here where it says expel is going to be the void. And then face down is going to be exiled cards. Um, in this game, it's referred to as uh, Q uh, QTing a card. QT stands for quantum tunneling. That's a quantum physics term. Um, basically, in a really simplistic sort of sense, it's the ability of like a quantum particle to teleport itself um, through kind of space and like even through like solid objects. Because according to the theory, there's uh, a non-zero probability that this quantum particle can exist um, anywhere else than its current location. And so, just to kind of bring it ourselves back to the game here, it's just a way of saying that like you're teleporting it way out of your reach. Okay?
All right. Because in, in this game, uh, you, sort of the lore is that you are using a portal to summon your cards from alternate dimensions and realities. And so when you're quantum tunneling a card, you're sending it beyond the, like, the reach of your portal. Okay. So um, these are the cards in the discard pile. And what we want to do is we want to send this to expel, like so. So its ability states that if discarded, this card is sent to the void instead. If this card is in the void, uh, I place counters on it for each fossil sort of unit in the void and for each one that is sent to the void. And then during um, any player's turn, I can remove any of these any amount of these counters to inflict an enemy unit with drown equal to the number of counters that I removed. So drown is one of several status afflictions within the game of doorkeeper. What drown does is it negates the effects of an enemy card. Or if you want to target one of your own cards for whatever reason, it can also negate those effects. Um, all right, so then I'm pretty much done with my turn and I would pass it at this point. But let's pretend that we're uh, a few turns into the game and let's pretend that my passive leader is at level four and I have, oh, I don't know, say, uh, let's see, face up, this card and this card and this card that are all under my control. And they're under my control because we'll say that I have played this card at this point. I've paid its cost and all that. And if you recall, the active leader is going to be on the field. And so we're going to represent that. Um, in the physical version, you're going to be using uh, pawns that are numbered one through six, because you can have up to six legions. Legions are groups of units up to five. And so for this first legion, this is always a little bit frustrating and untap, but we're going to try and group these together. All right, just a second here. Okay, well, of course this would happen. But pretend that they're grouped together. Um, if they're grouped together as a legion, they can move uh, for just one order, a movement order. Again, your orders are going to be the total indicated here on your passive leader card and your active leader card. So again, we'd have six orders. We'll say that this legion was from here, entered this territory, spent an order to move in, spent another order to move in, and spent another order to move in here, and we spent our other three orders um, conquering these territories as we go. Once you enter a territory, you can spend an order to conquer it, um, but you don't have to. You can just kind of pass through it. If there's, you know, no enemy units in that territory, then it's, as I just explained, just spend the order. But if there is an, an enemy unit, excuse me, let's say this is off to the side. Let's say um, I have my unit here. Okay, it just kind of disappeared under that card that I wasn't supposed to have. Perfect. All right, so let's say my card is here and my enemy's card is here. And let's say I want to go from here to here. Then I would engage in a skirmish. Uh, this video is getting kind of long, so I'll explain that later. But basically a skirmish is just a fight. And let's just say that this guy, this summoner, destroys this summoner. And I would 
take my card, I would target source, I would declare this as you know the target, and then we would fight. Um, but yeah, then let's send because this is mirroring, so I'll send my own card to the discard there, and then we'll pretend that it's still here. So then now, uh, because I was able to defeat my enemy who will pretend had control over this territory. Then now that they are defeated, I can move my card back into here and claim that territory. All right, so um, pretend that we've advanced uh, a few more turns. We're now at our opponent's back row here and we are going to take down their sentries. For sentries, they have 15 health and 10 counter. So that's quite a lot, especially when your average card only has, you know, 2 to 5 as their main stat. Um, and so you're going to want to have quite a few cards in a legion, quite a few powerful cards in a legion uh, to take down these sentries. But once you defeat all those sentries, then you just have to take your card, your legion, if it will let me put it there. I guess it won't. There we go. And we'll pretend that all their sentries are destroyed. So now I take my card, representing my legion, as we are pretending, and I move it to my enemy's base, where I declare an attack on their passive leader. We'll pretend that my legion is more powerful than their enemy leader, and I, you know, enter a skirmish, I destroy them, and then I win the game. And that's it. Uh, this was a pretty long video, so thanks for sticking around. Uh, I might have to split it into a couple parts, and uh, yeah, really sorry how long this was. I know this was a lot to explain, I, I didn't even get through everything, but I hope that this really helped to visualize the game, and stay tuned for any sort of updates. Alright.